Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Today I'm speaking once again to my friend Joseph Goldstein. Joseph is a meditation teacher. He started the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts, where I did, I think, most of my retreats back in the day. And he's been on two earlier podcasts, podcast number four and 15. And if you haven't heard those, those are worth listening to because you find out who Joseph is and how he got so deeply into practice. It is no exaggeration to say that Joseph is as responsible as anyone for bringing the practice of Vipassana, otherwise known as mindfulness, to the West from India. Joseph is certainly one of the finest meditation teachers I know. And today we take your questions in an AMA, and we deal with some basic questions like, you know, why meditate in the first place? And how long do negative emotions actually last when you pay attention to them? But then we get into esoterica like selflessness and the Buddhist concept of enlightenment and topics that will only be of interest uh, perhaps to a subset of you. And again, as always, if you find conversations like this valuable, you are free and encouraged to support the podcast at samharris.org forward slash support. And now I bring you Joseph Goldstein. I am back here for a third podcast with my friend Joseph Goldstein. Joseph, thank you for doing this once again. My pleasure. So we have taken questions from the internet this time around so as to ensure that we answer questions that are interesting to people rather than try to find our way through the, the maze of our minds together. We went out on Twitter and Facebook and got a bunch of questions. First, I got many questions about my meditation app, and I am increasingly embarrassed to say it is still coming. It is still coming, but I have just, it's been a, a long and somewhat painful education in what is required to develop an app. I'm confident that we will beta test this soon. So more on that, hopefully within a month or so. But Joseph, you already have a meditation app that you did with our friend Dan Harris. So if you are hungry for a meditation app, you can get Joseph's immediately. And that is called 10% Happier. There are a few questions on why one would use an app and, and the utility of guided meditations. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. But Joseph is available to you right now on an app as a meditation teacher. So Joseph, the first question, why should I care about meditation practice or mindfulness? Why should I start a practice like this? What am I missing? Well, I think the answer to that is really very simple. The first time when I went to India, when I was looking for a teacher, uh, ended up in India, Bodh Gaya. Uh, that's where the place the Buddha was enlightened. And I met my first teacher there and he said something very simple to me the first time I met him. And I think it conveys the underlying reason why we meditate. He said, if you want to understand your mind, sit down and observe it. And I just appreciated the simplicity of that. There was nothing to join, no rituals, no ceremonies. It's just the simple understanding that understanding ourselves is possible. It's very pragmatic and very simple, and there is a methodology for doing it. In that understanding of ourselves, we begin to see what creates suffering in our lives and what brings greater happiness and peace. And when we see that, we can make wiser choices. And as we make wiser choices, we become happier. And as we become happier, we make wiser choices in our lives. So it becomes mm -hmm. a spiral of greater fulfillment and greater ease. So you would say there's a direct connection between understanding the nature of your mind and in particular, being able to observe its character moment to moment and actually living a wiser life and making better decisions that translate into your own happiness or ceasing to suffer unnecessarily. Oh, definitely. I mean, because we, we're all a mixture. You know, we, we all have a whole range of skillful and unskillful thoughts. And we begin to see very directly without, without an intermediary you know, the kinds of thoughts and feelings and emotions that are productive of suffering for ourselves and others. You know, when we feel greedy or angry or envious or jealous or, you know, a lot of what are called the afflictive emotions. 
we can see directly and feel directly uh, their nature. And we say, oh, this would be good to let go of. And we see those kind of thought patterns and emotions that are actually happiness producing. But this is not theoretical. It, you know, th that's the beauty of meditation, that it's not theoretical. It's not just following what we read in the book. We're actually experiencing for ourselves the nature of these thoughts, of these emotions. And we see that, you know, when we're feeling generous, we're feeling kind, we're feeling compassionate, it makes us happy and it makes the people around us happy. And so the choices become more obvious. This is not to say that in the first hour of our meditation, all the old habit patterns of our mind, the unskillful ones are going to disappear. This is, this is why it's called meditation practice. Mm. You know, it takes a repeated uh, seeing and learning to effect the transformation. Well, can you say something about how being able to observe the nature of your own thoughts and emotions and reactions, merely being able to observe it translates into being able to change mm -hmm. course in any way. That's not intuitively obvious that that would be the case. It happens, uh, I think, in a couple of ways. In one very obvious way, we begin to see the difference between being lost in a thought pattern, where we're just carried away in a train of association, you know, and we're just lost in, in the thought, uh, in all the emotions involved with it, and it can be lost for a short period of time, it can be lost for a really long period of time. We see the difference between that and being mindful that the thought and emotion are present. So this is a huge understanding because before people begin some kind of introspection, you know, some kind of meditative discipline, mostly we're just lost in and acting out whatever particular pattern of thoughts and, and emotions are there. With meditation or with mindfulness, we're actually beginning to observe the fact that they're there as they're happening. And so that gives us a little space, it gives us the possibility of not being carried away by them. And in that space, we have the choice. Do I want to build on this? Do I want to follow this? Or do I want to let it go? So that's one, one way the mindfulness gives us that freedom. Second way is what we actually learn from being mindful. And one of the things we learn is that all of these thoughts, emotions, and everything else uh, are impermanent. That they're there, and they're there for some time, and then they disappear. And even though we all know this intellectually, we don't live it as, we, <laughs> as if we know it. Mm. You know, we take, we take our thoughts and emotions to be so stable in who we are. So seeing the impermanence of them again and again and again begins to loosen the bonds of attachment to them. It's interesting to be precise in describing just how much of a change this is experientially when, when you really grasp the impermanence of an emotion like anger say. So how long would you say you could stay angry without being lost in thought about the reasons why you should be angry? So you're thinking about an argument you just had, say, and you're not aware of a thought, that thought arising. So you're identified with a thought, you're lost in the thought, you're getting angry. And now, because you know how to practice mindfulness, you notice a thought as a thought, right? You unhook from, you're, you're no longer identified with that bit of language or image in your mind. And the emotion of anger is still present because it's just, it's a matter of physiology. It, it arose and it takes some time to subside. It has some sort of half-life. Most people are walking around with the impression that it's possible to stay angry for hours or even days, <laughs> right? How long would you think you could be angry <laughs> if you were not subsequently lost in the next train of thought? I think not very long. Uh, generally, when people are not watching their minds this carefully, uh, may not be realizing that there's a con pretty continual stream of thoughts that's feeding the anger. Mm. You know, and so we may catch a thought or two, see it, release a little bit, and maybe feel an easing of the anger, and then 10 seconds later, or a minute later, another thought comes. 
Mm. you know, which triggers the emotion again. Without that continual feeding of the emotion, uh, I don't know exactly you but, know, how, how long it would last, but it certainly wouldn't last as long as it usually does. But I mean, I would put, put it on the order of seconds, uh -huh. not even minutes, and certainly not hours. Right. Like if you, if you were actually completely unhooked from the discursive thinking that is producing the anger, how long can, can the emotion of anger stay present in your mind? Uh, you think you could be angry no. for five minutes? Here, this gets to be an interesting question because it's really about then how we define anger. So, for example, the mind changes a lot more quickly than the body, right? Just the rapidity of change. So the feeling of anger in the mind might disappear pretty quickly, right. as you say, but there may be a residue of what we would call anger in terms of the bodily feeling. Right, the, phys the physiological tension, the arousal. The physio yeah. yeah, so that may last a bit longer than the actual emotional feeling of anger in the mind. But emotion seems to me uh, a complex phenomenon that involves both the body and mind. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's hard to isolate just the mental aspect. Yeah, well, it also has the, the physiology of two different emotions can be very similar, and it's the cognitive interpretation of what's going on. This is, yes. I think this is still known as the James Lang theory of emotion in psychology, going back to William James. Many, perhaps even before William James, have noticed that an emotion like fear or anxiety is very similar to, to a positive emotion like excitement, and yet it's just it's the interpretation of that arousal that makes for the difference. So when you're no longer interpreting, and then you just feel mm -hmm. pure physiology, in my experience at that moment, as you say, it goes to the question of what is an emotion? What is anger in this case? It's not mere physiological arousal, right? It's arousal mm -hmm. that has a, a psychological significance and points to very likely some subsequent goal-oriented actions you may want to take based on this. It's a motive or a set of intentions. And when you break the spell of you are thinking about it and all you're left with is the physiology, I would say it ceases to be anger. Yes. It's basically ha has all the, the psychological import of something like indigestion or a pain <laughs> in your knee or, I mean, so it's something that really is just has absolutely no implications at all. It's just your body at that moment. But then again, as you say, if in the next moment you are lost in thought about why you have every right to be angry at this person, well, then it instantly becomes anger again. Right. So. There's another component of this, which is, is, and this is kind of what makes the meditation so interesting because there are, there are just different levels to what's going on. So, you know, so if we can unhook from the thoughts and we're just left with the physiological uh, remains, you know, of whatever the thought pattern was. Mm. So then the question becomes, how are we relating to those physical energetic sensations? If they're unpleasant, we may no longer be feeling anger towards the content of our previous thoughts, but we may be feeling, we could say, aversion to the unpleasant sensations that are the residue. Mm. So that becomes another level to look at. You know, how's the mind relating to that energetic phenomena? Right. So that, that becomes another place of investigation. So the, the flip side of this, and this is another, the other question we have more or less on this topic, can meditation or mindfulness be bad for you? Are there people who shouldn't meditate or shouldn't go on silent retreat? And I guess I would add to this, you've just talked about how increasing your ability to observe the flow of your own consciousness reduces suffering, seemingly almost by definition, and gives you an ability to choose more wisely. But is there a period in one's practice where seeing more actually just translates into more suffering or new kinds of suffering that wouldn't be there otherwise. So take both parts of that. If Even if meditation is ultimately good for you, are there periods where it can certainly seem to be bad for you? And are there people for whom it's actually bad? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, for different people at different times, it's not, I would say it's not recommended, certainly in terms of intensive silent retreat. You know, so something might be good in short doses, but 
in, in larger doses may not be helpful. For example, if somebody is really suffering from a deep depression, the isolation of a meditation retreat where people are in silence and not talking, that might be counterproductive. I mean, mm. what might be needed more is some kind of engagement with other people or therapeutic skills. Uh, so that would be one, one area where it would be worth looking to see is the form of meditation the right form for mm. what's going on. And we should say that you do encounter this problem with some regularity on silent retreat where people who have some psychopathology like schizophrenia get in over their heads and it's just yeah. objectively bad for them to be in yes. isolation and silence. Yes. yes. I would say that, that that does happen, definitely. And over the years we've experienced that. It's not the common experience. Mm. For most people, the practice and the various forms of practice work well. But there are these cases where it doesn't. So, so then there's the question of even if meditation is good for you, there can be periods where it doesn't seem to be good for you in terms of the character of your experience is getting worse by some metric. This, this points to kind of a key question in understanding the appropriateness of meditation at a particular time. And it has less to do with what it is that's arising, whether what's arising is difficult or not, because in meditation, lots of difficult things come, whether it's physical pain or really difficult emotions, you know, or memories. So sometimes we're really facing different aspects of suffering in our lives. The question of whether it's skillful to continue and proceed really has to do with the quality of balance in the mind and whether there's enough balance, enough mindfulness to hold those difficulties without being overwhelmed by them, without getting caught up in them too much. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do get caught up to some extent until we learn how to, you know, create a place of balance. But that's where a teacher can be really helpful because I'm very often when I'm teaching retreats and other teachers as well, if we see somebody losing their balance, you know, really getting overwhelmed by what's coming up, we'll very often suggest back off a little bit, you know, and go for a walk or relax or do a little reading as a way of titrating the speed of the material that may be coming up. Uh, so it's, it's very much a, a question of finding the right balance uh, for dealing with particularly difficult material. The difficulties themselves are not a problem. They come up for everybody. But it's really our capacity to be with them, either in a skillful way or not. And that's, that's the key question. The analogy I often use is to physical exercise. So physical exercise is, in a generic sense, objectively good and basically good for everyone. But if you have a specific injury, if you've got a bad knee, yes. well, then you have to work around that. Exactly. And, and there could be some exercises you just shouldn't do because exactly. it's synonymous with hurting an already injured knee. Yes. So there's all of those caveats, and yet you can still say that exercise is good for you in general. And there's a kind of a range of competence where you see, though you will never be, say, an Olympic athlete, right? You're not talking about me, are you? Yeah, I will never be an Olympic athlete. I can still see that the same principles by which an Olympic athlete becomes an Olympic athlete apply to me yes. and will make me as good as I can be at I think that, I think the that's pole a good vault, analogy. Say. And my pole vault is terrible. <laughs> Have you interacted with Willoughby Britton, a yes. scientist who yeah. has focused on the cautionary tales of intensive meditation practice, mm. where she's just she thinks that some number of people are harmed by meditation, and we in the scientific community have to understand that more and be less boosterish about mm. meditation, certainly intensive meditation practice, and more honest that there's a potential downside here. I don't know her, and I, she's someone who ultimately I probably should have on the podcast, but is there anything to react to in there beyond what we just well, said? Well, I, I think she has uh, pointed to the fact that in intensive practice, you know, where people are on like a silent retreat, meditating all day long, it can go very deep. We're, we're really going into the psyche, you know, on levels that we usually don't in our ordinary life. So it's a powerful, it's a very powerful process. And we're learning things 
about ourselves on many, many levels. It's not just the content of our stories, which in some ways is the most uh, obvious level, but we're learning about the basic ephemerality of our experience. And, you know, when we're experiencing the bodies in energy field dissolving, mm. uh, which, is a, which can be a meditative experience, it can be both exhilarating, but also for certain people, it could be destabilizing, you know, mm. because it's, it's very different than our usual solid sense of self. So I think she's pointing to that level of experience and the need to take a lot of care when we enter into that realm. And that's where well-trained teachers are really important. Because if somebody's not familiar with that terrain, as somebody enters into it, they may not be giving the best advice for how to stay balanced with it. And it's not to say that even well-trained teachers, you know, may make mistakes in offering some guidance, although that doesn't happen so often. Mm. When, when people are familiar with yeah with those experiences, as I said before, over the years of teaching and something we've learned, and it, it it took some time to learn it, is to know when people should back off. You know when things are getting out of balance, and with experience that just becomes more clear. Mm. Okay, next question. I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on the use of meditation to cope with negative emotion. This is something we've already gotten into. Is it fundamentally misguided from either of your perspectives to use meditation to make yourself feel better when you aren't happy? So this cuts to really something that, that falls out of the definition of mindfulness, which we should probably just remind people what it entails as a matter of attention. Mindfulness, by definition, is a type of mere attention to character of one's experience, which does not have an agenda. I mean, you have to surrender your agenda to be mindful, because your agenda would be subtly or grossly coloring your attention with grasping at what's pleasant or aversion to what's unpleasant. So you have to be willing to just be aware of an unpleasant emotion, a negative emotion in this case, or an unpleasant sensation, without seeking to change it. And yet the reason why one is mindful in the first place is implicitly goal-oriented because you want to change the character of your experience. You want to be less distracted. You want to stop suffering unnecessarily. You want to be able to make the wise choices of the sort that you just described. So, so how do you deal with that apparent paradox in the moment? Yeah. I think this uh, points to an interesting question that I think is coming up more and more these days with the growing popularity of mindfulness, you know, in more secular uh, situations. And there's even kind of a movement called secular mindfulness. Mm. Um, and it really points to the need to uh, define how we're using the word mindfulness in different contexts. Because in the ordinary way it's being used, now, broadly speaking, I think one could define it in the way you suggested of just paying attention in the moment, you know, being undistracted, coming back when you lost. So just a very kind of simple, generic kind of awareness, which is very helpful. That begins to open us up to a different understanding of our minds. But there are also deeper meanings of mindfulness, which become more significant when we undertake it or understand it as a vehicle for something more than simply being a little happier in the moment, but rather see mindfulness as a vehicle or a methodology for what we could call awakening or, you know, a more, a more profound spiritual understanding, that there's something else that it has the potential to reveal. In that meaning of mindfulness, there's not only a choiceless awareness, you know, which you were talking about, but 
embedded in the meaning of mindfulness in that context is also, you could say, a discerning wisdom of what is skillful and what is unskillful, what causes well, wholesome and unwholesome, whatever words you like mm -hmm. to use. So there is the acknowledgement and the understanding embedded in that kind of mindfulness that some mind states are the cause or, or cause us or, or others of suffering, that, that create suffering in our experience, uh, both for ourselves and others. And there are certain mind states which are freeing. So already there's a wisdom component, you know, in that kind of mindfulness, which takes us a bit further than simply being attentive to what's arising. It's like, it's attentive to what's arising, but also learning from being attentive. Mm. You know, what, what is it we're actually learning from being mindful? And in that, there is, you could say, there is an implicit choice being made to cultivate the skillful and to let go of the unskillful. Except in the moment, there's another level there where the choicelessness is actually the deeper insight in that if you can truly be mindful of the anger, say, that was there a moment ago as anger because you were identified with thought and not being mindful, if you're truly mindful in the next moment, then you realize that anger is just as good an object of mindfulness or, you know, the residue of anger is just as good an object of mindfulness as anything else, including a skillful emotion. You know, this is the phrase one taste yes. in, in the Tibetan tradition. Yes. So it, the agenda goes away in that moment of mindfulness. Yes. It's, it's almost like, I'm not sure I remember this correctly, so you, you might clarify it if I don't, but that Zen, uh, that Zen teaching about in the beginning, trees are trees and rivers are rivers. So first there is a mountain, then yeah, and then there and is. And there is no mountain, then there is. It's his Donovan song, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was first they, a Zen they, teaching, they, then, yeah. and then it was a, a Donovan song. Yeah. So things are, first we see them as being ordinary, yeah. you know. So that's the first kind of attention. We're just seeing things arise without this discernment. Then we're seeing them with a discernment of what's skillful and unskillful. And through seeing that, we drop into the level you just described where we're experiencing everything as being empty, you know, empty of substance and therefore equal in that sense. It's very few people who can jump and sus jump to and sustain that level. There's a whole uh, foundation of understanding that makes that possible. Mm. And I think in, in all the in all the meditative traditions that's understood in in the Tibetan tradition and certainly in Theravada tradition and there are practices which help to stabilize that deeper level. Right. So so in the beginning of virtually any tradition, I wouldn't say every, but certainly most, there's an acknowledgement that there are certain classically positive mental states that are a better foundation for exploring than the classically negative mental states that just entangle you in your own neurotic okay. misadventures. In exactly. The world. And, and that discernment actually provides the motivation for going deeper, right. for going to the other level. Because if one is not seeing that, why do anything? And this is, I think, a cautionary note. Is It's very easy to bypass. Mm. You know, sometimes people talk about emotional bypass and they jump to a level where, oh, it's, everything's empty, it doesn't matter. There's also, you could call it a meditative bypass. <laughs> you know, where, oh, everything is equal, therefore it doesn't matter what I do. Right. Or what kinds of thoughts are being cultivated. But that's missing an important piece. You know, even though we eventually come to the place of what you called one taste, that comes through a very clear discernment, you know, of what on another level we see, oh yeah, this is helpful. This is wholesome. This is not. Mm. I, I think the bypass, and I've seen this, you know, in various, you know, meditators and communities where people can justify unwholesome actions with the rubric, it's, it's all empty. Yeah, well, you can see some film footage of Rajneesh's community <laughs> and get a sense of where that leads. I mean, once you admit to yourself that no matter how much you're meditating, a significant percentage of your time will be spent 
merely captive to the yes. contents and character of your thought, then it matters what yes. you tend to think and, yes. and feel about other people, yes. say, or yeah. the kinds of relationships yeah. you form on that basis yeah. and all the rest. So I, I just want to jump in here for a minute. I think that's why it's important and acknowledged, as you say, in most meditative or spiritual traditions, that, and that there needs to be an ethical foundation to the practice. Mm. Because until the mind is extremely well-trained, we do get lost in the conditioning, you know, of our habit patterns. And so we will be acting out both the more positive and more negative thought patterns and emotional patterns. Having an explicit ethical foundation becomes another kind of support and protection. So as we're about to do something, maybe we're about to, to lie, you know, or to, to speak unskillfully. If we have in our minds, no, that's, this is unethical. This is, this is a harmful action. Right. Just that, you know, in that moment can become a reminder to actually pay attention. Say more about speaking unskillfully. Obviously, that's a term of, of art or jargon within Buddhism. What are the range of things that mm. it covers? I love talking about this because this is a practice that for everybody can have such a tremendous impact in our lives, mostly because we speak a lot. You know, we, we get up in the morning and we spend most of the day or a good part of the day speaking. I think very few people actually pay attention before they speak to what they're going to say. And I've, you know, I've certainly seen this in myself enough times where words seem to just come tumbling out in the enthusiasm one way or another of the moment. Also the intention behind what they're saying. Well, exactly. Why are they saying exactly. that? Exactly. You know, it, very often there is a motivation to divide or to cause harm in some way or to speak what is untrue. Or one of my favorites, which it amuses me to see it, is what in, in the Buddhist tradition is called useless talk, where it serves no purpose. And the, the word in Pali, which is the ancient language of India that a lot of the texts are written in, the Pali word for useless talk, it's, it's really anamadapiya, because the Pali word is sampapalapa. Mm -hmm. So it sounds just like what it is. Right. And very often I'll be in a conversation, you know, with friends or a group of people, and just see the urge to say something that is completely useless, and it's just a way of declaring, here I am. That's its only purpose. And... When I see that, when I can catch that impulse, mm. see that this is some pop up, this is useless, and refrain, it actually feels good. It, it feels like a conservation of energy. It's not, it's not just spilling out, you know, verbal energy. And it makes our words more valuable. People have more respect for what we say if what we mm. say is useful in some way. So that's just one, one mm. example. I think there might be ways in which the Buddhist conception of right speech may not totally map onto what we understand about human speech now. So for instance, like gossip mm -hmm. is a classic example of wrong speech in a Buddhist sense. And you can see how you can see how divisive gossip often is. You can see how you tend to feel when you are around people who are gossiping especially mm -hmm. if it's malicious gossip, the impulse in oneself to dish about somebody who's not present can certainly seem, under scrutiny, seem like you know, not the noblest of things. But gossip also does serve a function, and in many cases it serves a, a good social function. Gossiping about others serves a function, and living in a context where you know you might be gossiped about, so you have a reputation that you are concerned to manage, mm -hmm. That also serves a function. It actually builds in a kind of moral shame and it puts a few breaks on the system, you know, and people who are totally shameless, well, some of them get elected president of the United <laughs> States, but in the usual case, it doesn't work out quite that well. So what do you think about gossip? Do you just think it's in intrinsically bad across the board? Or, no, or... I, 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 th I think what you're pointing to is that we use that term 
to cover quite a wide range of speech. And I would say kind of the dividing line or a dividing line between what might one might call useful gossip mm. and harmful gossip. One dividing line, which is very interesting to observe, is what our motivation is. You know, is our motivation really to harm someone, you know, or to cause divisiveness? Or is it in some way the sharing of information that seems useful to share? Yeah. Because if the motivation is to harm, in the repetition of that kind of speech, we are creating within ourselves a toxic mental environment. We're creating in our, in our own mind stream impulses and actions filled with some degree of aversion, of hatred, of fear, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever the unwholesome motivation is. So we're just strengthening these forces in the mind that cause us suffering, you know, and are creating an inner world for ourselves that's not a peaceful one, as well as, you know, causing harm to others. So I would say really looking at the motivation behind whatever mm -hmm. it is that we're calling gossip is a key element. But what about the case where the motivation certainly isn't obviously noble, but nor is it obviously malicious? It seems to me that most gossip arises on the basis of people wanting to have amusing, entertaining conversations. So like, I have a great, oh, you won't believe what happened to X. It's not that I have a malicious attitude toward X. It's not that I want necessarily want to harm X's reputation with you, mm -hmm. but this is just something yeah. amusing that has come to mind. And the crucial variable for me, I guess, now I'm kind of looking for the, the algorithm that covers all of these cases, the measure of the toxicity of any of these moments is I think largely in the, in the distance between how I'm talking about X now to you and how I would be willing to talk about X mm -hmm. knowing that X was going to overhear it or if X were in the room, right? If, if there's a drastic difference there, yes. that suggests something unskillful, yes. to put it in Buddhist terms, about my attitude and motives and all the rest. No, oh, I think that's a good, a good simple uh, frame right. in which to assess. I think there is a more subtle level which would not fall within that framework. And that is something that I've noticed in myself and I see it in others as well. Even in what seems like benign, you know, gossip, the, mm. kind of the example you say, an interesting aspect to pay attention to is whether in some way, whether speaking in that way is coming from or reinforces a sense of self. And I think in very subtle ways, even when it's, you know, it's not malicious and we're not intending to harm, very often there's just a... Uh, a self-aggrandizing motive. Some, or, yeah. Something, or self-satisfaction, or... Schadenfreude, or... Something. I, mm. And so that would just be worth investigating, you yeah. know, to see whether that's there or not, you know. Let's talk about that, because this notion that something about the success of meditation translates into an erosion of self, right? A sense of self, yeah. That is surprising mm -hmm. to most people, and on its face, I think, undesirable to most people. And it's also something you don't find very much in what you call the, the secularization of mindfulness. Mindfulness as a, as a useful thing to have in your business toolkit, or your efficiency toolkit, or your, you know, the, something that a life coach mm -hmm. would give you to improve your functioning in, in one domain or another. So how do you view the secularization and popularization of mindfulness in the absence of a clear teaching about selflessness or the illusoriness of the self and the other, the other mm -hmm. elements of classic Buddhist anchor to the practice? Basically, I think it's great. I think mindfulness at whatever level and this seems to be borne out, you know, in people's experience and when it's taught in a secular way, it seems to be helpful. People are getting something from it, you know, so I think that's great. I don't, I don't, I don't have any problems with that at all. 
uh, and I'm glad that it's happening. Mm. In that, I'm hoping that the deeper aspects of the practice and the teachings are not lost for those who want to pursue them. Mm. That's all. So, so people are not left with the impression that that's all that mindfulness can offer. You know, if people choose to stay with, with that, we could say level of practice, that's fine because it definitely enhances the quality of one's life and there's more. And so I think it's just helpful in the, even in the teaching of secular mindfulness for people who are aware of the greater depth of potential that's possible, even just to mention that, mm. you know, that for those of you who are interested, there are other possibilities as well in this practice. That's also the whole spectrum, you know, of what's possible uh, is known. If I recall correctly, there is a Buddhist sutta. This is where my limits as a Pali scholar will likely show themselves. But isn't there a sutta called the Mahamangala Sutta where the Buddha talked about different levels of happiness and Basically, it's just a straightforward acknowledgement that there's a hierarchy of happiness or you have many tiers yes. to, to happiness where, you know, the fact that there are deeper, more profound forms of happiness that go into mm. very esoteric areas of things like Buddhahood, that doesn't negate that every one of these steps is a step in the direction of happiness. So yes. just having a healthy family is, is a form of happiness. It yes. just goes deeper yes. and deeper and yes. deeper and deeper into the esoterica yeah. of Nibbana. Just there's there's the flip side of that as well, for those people who might be thinking that by going or aiming for you know the higher happiness somehow they're going to miss out mm -hmm. on the kinds of happiness we're more familiar with. Uh, my first teacher, uh, his name was Muninjaji, he used to say something which which I really loved. He said, "If you aim for the highest happiness." all the others come along the way. Mm. So it's not a question of missing out on anything. It's actually enhancing the, the probability that we'll experience all the kinds of happiness because we understand their causes. We understand what gives rise to them. That's a, a nice sentiment. I'm not <laughs> so sure I've seen that borne out in the Dharma community. What I believe I've seen among Buddhists and hippies and New Agers and people who have quote, aimed at the highest happiness in explicitly, you know, meditative mm. terms, I feel like I've seen a lot of casualties of the Dharma. I've seen people who have, because they spent, you know, crucial years of their lives engaged in these esoteric pursuits, they actually didn't become self-actualized in ways that they really would want to have been to access ordinary levels of happiness, to have ordinary careers or to start families at the right time or to make money when, the, when it was easy to make money so that they had money when it was harder to make money, you know, when they're older. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a kind of mismatch between the enlightenment project, we should get to what the, the most esoteric goal of meditation actually is, but I feel like I've seen people who, I guess, fell through the cracks in a way because it's hard, it's obviously, it's hard to, to reach the goal. It's hard to meditate so effectively that your feeling of well-being becomes impregnable and is no longer dependent on anything substantive happening in your life, right? So it's hard to become the person who doesn't really care whether you got to have kids if you're the person who really want, you know, really wanted kids, right? But now you've spent 20 years in Nepal studying with llamas and you miss that chapter of your life. So I mean, do you want to say anything about the casualties of the, the 60s or the Dharma or any, or any other way you want to frame it? Well, I think the 60s are, are fast fading into the, the mists of history. The 60s are back. <laughs> with psychedelics are now being right. used in science now. I think the point you raised is, is an important one in that undertaking a path of practice in the way that you talked about really requires or is helped by a certain level of, you could say, emotional maturity or understanding and a realistic assessment, both of one's life, one's opportunities, one's aspirations, one's goals, and to, to somehow integrate all of that in one's decision. 
So there are many ways to practice. And even in the Buddhist time, many lay people practiced and achieved high levels of realization. So if there is that strong wish to both go as, as deep as possible, you know, in a spiritual path and also live a fulfilled, we could say worldly life, it's helpful to know that about oneself. And so then one makes the choices appropriate to that. And it may not be going off for 20 years to Nepal. Hmm. You know, it may be doing intensive practice in ways that fit into the more worldly aspirations. But it's really no different than, you know, somebody who is just has this thirst or hunger or a passion to become an artist. Mm-hmm. You know, and they devote years of their life to their art. And they may never be a Rembrandt, mm-hmm. you know, and they may end up in a worldly situation that's not so successful in worldly terms. Mm-hmm. But they have fulfilled that side of themselves. And so I think it's the same thing. Some people have a passion for this kind of practice and are willing to say, okay, what, whatever comes will come from it. Right. And, and as I said, other people may also be very dedicated but want to be more inclusive of other aspects of their lives. So I think both, both are really possible. And there'll be some people who make mistakes, you know, who make the wrong choice. Mm. which happens in every arena. Let's talk about this this concept of realization. You just used that term, enlightenment. I guess an earlier stage could be called awakening. What, what do these words mean? And how do you explain them to someone who hasn't had any experience in mm. meditation? I think the simplest and most pragmatic way of understanding it, and I think we probably have talked about this before in previous discussions, uh, but I find this just the most down-to-earth way of understanding it rather than this some great mystical experience. Is the mind free, free of those patterns and tendencies that cause suffering, like in traditional Buddhism, uh, of greed and hatred and delusion. So we could say enlightenment is the mind free of those forces. Now, this can be interpreted in two ways. And we've talked about this, in fact, just last night. It can be interpreted in terms of these forces are actually uprooted so that they don't arise again. And this is a very classical view of the path of enlightenment, that they're progressively weakened and finally uprooted from the mind stream. Another way of viewing it, which many teachers and traditions do, is not so much, you know, with the understanding that they're uprooted, but rather in the moment of their arising, they're seen through. So Mm -hmm. we're not caught by them in any way. In both cases, the mind is free. I take a, uh, I have a slight bias towards one of these views, Mm -hmm. but I take a somewhat agnostic position in terms of uh, the ultimate truth of one or the other. And I'm kind of waiting to see. Right. You know, so, and it'll be interesting. <laughs> when, when, when we have finally accomplished <laughs> the fullness of the path, we'll, we'll know for ourselves whether they're uprooted or they're simply seen through. Let's drill down on that a little bit more. So what does uprooting mean in your experience? What can you say firsthand that you have uprooted so that you know it's possible to uproot such a thing? Well, certainly uh, some hair follicles. <laughs> I, I <laughs> they, feel that somehow I'm following you on that. They have been uprooted. Despicable and they path. Don't, they don't seem to be arising again. Uh, so that's one very significant arena. You are, you were a long bit of master on that path. <laughs> so this is a very classical progression but one that I feel that I have experienced, the first stage in this process, the deeply rooted view or conception of self, that, that there is some, some self that's at the center of all experience and to whom all experience refers. Mm. 
and this is this is a deeply rooted conditioning of the mind. This is this is the common and the common sense view. You yeah. know, that I'm the one doing it all. So you can point to a day on the calendar where you lost that feeling. Yes. Yes. So say more about that. So the image that came to mind, you know, and it, it was a meditative experience arising out of a very clear looking at the mind itself, at awareness itself. And at a certain point, as the appropriate conditions came together, there was the experience of and here's where it's going to sound a little esoteric and it's very hard to put into language, but in the observation of this stream of phenomena, you know, which is our life, our mind and our body, the experience of, we could call, it, it has been called the unborn or non-occurrence or what in that moment, in my own mind, it, it, I framed it as zero. Mm. You know, there's, and so the, in that experience of the zero center of it all, it became clear that there was no, and this is a little pun on the words, there was no one mm. to whom it was all happening. It was just phenomena arising and passing away in a certain pattern that could conventionally be called self or Joseph or I. So those words are fine. It's not that mm. we have to get rid of that language, but there's the understanding that it doesn't ultimately refer to any, any existing phenomena because the mind has opened to zero, you know, and that, that was the transforming moment. And then, you know, still the mind gets caught many, many times in becoming identified with various things and thoughts and emotions. So it's not at that moment. Let me just go over that one more time with you, because it sounds like what you're saying there is that you had this experience, and obviously you and I have spoken about this for hours and hours, if not weeks and months. <laughs> and on our previous podcast, I think we probably got into this a fair amount, but there are two ways this could be uprooted for you. You could have had this experience of zero, and then that has certain implications for you going forward. So you have, you have experienced zero on a Tuesday, and then on Wednesday, someone says, hey, do you still have a, a stable self that's carried through from one moment to the next in consciousness? And you retrospectively, based on the experience on Tuesday, you think of its implications and you say, oh no, I, I know that's not the case. I've, I've uprooted that delusion because I had this experience scarcely 24 hours ago that informs me that that can't be true. Now, you obviously hear or see where I'm going with this. The other form of uprooting is based on having had that experience on Tuesday, now Wednesday and every subsequent day for the rest of your life, when any person taps you on the shoulder and says, do you have a self? And you look, you actually are, are presented with the vivid evidence of the absence of a, of a sense that you used to have, right? You used to have yes. a sense which is no longer there in any moment where you check for yes. the rest of your life. Yes. So presumably you are signing up for the, the second option, right? Yes. But, but are there people in the first category who have an experience like what you're calling zero, but their loss of, of, of a self view is this retrospective, yes. I bank this as yeah. a kind of conceptual change yeah. for myself? I, I think that there are both because traditionally, in, in the traditional unfolding of meditative practice, especially of this particular kind of practice, there is a, you could say, a spectrum or a deepening understanding of selflessness on different levels. And so people can have a very deep understanding of the selflessness of the process, where they see it's just empty phenomena rolling on. But that's all that's happening. And people are in that experience and experiencing it fully, but it's not yet at the point where the view of self has been uprooted. And that's where this notion of uprooting, I think, really has significance. Because in what I just described, that 
is the experience of many people of, of your first alternative, you know, where they really have had the experience of selflessness, but it's not something that is totally, totally uprooted. And so in, on Wednesday or Thursday, they can remember that. Right. But the self comes back. The sense of self. The sense of self comes back. And then, and then, they, then their concern is how to get back to that feeling of selflessness through practice. It's not obvious that the self isn't there in the first place. Well, it can be obvious to us. I mean, I think at deep, you know, at deep levels of practice, it is obvious at that time. No, at that time, but, yeah. but afterwards, when, yeah, they're, but, when they're no longer at yeah, any kind of deep level of practice, yeah. then they're left to remember this period of selflessness that they had when they were... You know, I, I don't know whether this is going to get a little too esoteric, esoteric for this conversation, but I, for me, it's actually a, quite a helpful template mm. where the Buddha talked about three levels of hallucination or distortion. Mm. He, he talked about hallucination of perception, hallucination of mind, and hallucination of view. And these are three different levels. So hallucination of perception is when you walk on the road, you see a stick and you think it's a snake. So you're just perceiving it incorrectly. That's pretty easy to remedy. You know, you just walk up closer. You and look you more say, closely at the stick. Yeah, and, yeah. okay, this is, this is not a snake. The second level of distortion or hallucination is called distortion or hallucination of mind. And that is all the thoughts that come about from thinking it's a snake. You know, and so then there's fear and there's whatever thoughts you have or feelings mm -hmm. about a snake. So that's a more full, it's not just a simple perception. We're, we're creating a certain world that we're living in. Right. So that's a little hard. If we're lost in that world, we might not even be motivated to look more carefully. You know, so... So that's a little harder to uproot. But still, it's not that difficult because if we do look a little more carefully, we'll see. You know, this is just a piece of wood. The deepest level is hallucination of view. And... That's when you become a snake catcher. Exactly. And when the, when the hallucination of view is strong, and we have seen this play out, in every domain of our culture, most recently in the political arena, where when people hold to a certain view strongly, it doesn't matter what the evidence is. You can present all the evidence in the world, and it's not going to change that view. So this hallucination is the hardest one to uproot, because it, the mind gets so fixed. That's why the uprooting of the view of self is so transformative. Hmm. In the first two cases, you know, the perception of self we may, you know, see in the moment and even get caught in hallucination of mind. But when the view of self has been uprooted, then those other two, even though they may still happen, we may get caught again in those other hallucinations but the view is gone. And then that's why they don't have much hold. They're simply the residue of old patterns. Okay. But to go back to your particular experience of uprooting, which you can, you can cash out in at least in a, a first person sense of, you know, you have proven this at least to yourself, to your if own satisfaction. To so this is true. Yes. <laughs> uh, sometimes if not to you. <laughs> yes, you. You'll be hard pressed to prove it to me on any given day. So post Tuesday, Whenever you look for yourself, there is no self, right? It's not like you were at any point after that experience, you were left with an One hour, point. a day, a week, feeling like, oh man, the sense of self is back. Well, it's not so much the sense of self, the view of self. Because as I say, you can still get caught. I, still, I can still get caught in different emotions and different thought patterns, but... There's the understanding that they themselves are selfless. Yeah. So I want to talk about that because I want to talk about what it, it's like to still get caught mm. and are identified with thought post this uprooting of the view of self. But before we go any further in the direction of selflessness, from a Western psychological perspective, loss of a sense of self sounds... Undesirable. Almost by definition, 
a form of psychopathology. Yes. And I think it's well understood, or at least it's often believed, that there are many forms of neurosis and psychosis that can be described as a kind of erosion of yes. self, yes. self-boundaries, self-coherence. And is that, is that what you feel when we're together? That's what I've noticed in you. Are there pathological yeah. reductions of self? And what's the relevance of that phenomenon, if yeah. in fact it exists, to this, what you are clearly considering a, a normative breakthrough psychologically that, that is all to the good, which is just recognizing that the self doesn't exist as conventionally thought. You know, I th first, I, I, as you know, I, I'm not a psychologist, and so I'm not familiar very familiar with either the range of pathologies or the way the term self is used or defined psychologically. Hmm. My understanding from just in speaking with people about this and psychologists and therapists, the term self can be used in a lot of different ways. And so it means something very specific in we could call the Buddhist context or the meditative context, but in a psychological context, there is there are pathologies where what I call a kind of a healthy balance of the mind. When the mind is operating in a healthful way, one could call that a healthy self. Right, and I'm, that's fine. I I don't have any problem using the term, you know, in that way. And I think. The pathology you're describing is when that balance is not there, you know, in one way or another. The meditative experience and what the Buddha was talking about, in my understanding, is something very different than that, you know, and it, it is just the belief or the view that there is some self existent, unchanging, <laughs> something or other that is at the center or the core of our unfolding. You could say it might well be that there are pathologies which mimic that, you know, and could look like that. Mm. So you mean there are pathologies that could look like a form of awakening or enlightenment? Yeah. Crazy people can make some of the same noises as enlightened yogis. Possibly, although I have, I've not seen that. I mean, I, and I don't have a huge experience in this, but I've certainly, in the course of all these years of teaching, come across in meditation, in periods of meditation, of people getting lost in different pathologies of mind, and it does not look at all the same. Because as I mm -hmm. say, the balance, there's, there's no mental balance or ease at those times. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, the insightful understanding into selflessness is tremendously freeing. So let's talk about what it's like to lose the sense of self and yet not the be... The view of self. You've corrected me on this point now, I think, three times, except... <laughs> You're a slow learner. <laughs> previously, the previous two corrections, and I believe our podcast listeners will back me up here, have been, you've, you've corrected me toward the phrase sense of self. I talk about the illusoriness of the self, and you've corrected me towards <laughs> sense of self. I just use <laughs> sense of self, and you've moved the goalpost <laughs> to view of self. So uh, let's figure out okay, well, what, we're what about. your pet peeve is here. <laughs> Why not just say that the self isn't what it seems and doesn't exist as most people think it does? I mean, okay, that, yeah, why good, why not just that. bite the bullet there? Yeah, I mean, I'm so, good with that. So forget about sense, forget about okay. view. Let's just talk about the self. Okay. Most people think that there's an ego riding around in the center of their heads or in the stream of consciousness that is unchanging. There's a, a subject right. in the middle of their lives that's not simply identical to their experience, but it's having the experience, yes, right? Yes, so yes. that's the thing that yes. if you look closely at, it disappears, and yet your experience doesn't necessarily yes, disappear. Exactly, no. Right. Okay, so we're on the same page okay. there. Thank you. And for I've, got, I've got you <laughs> off my back, <laughs> happily. For those of you who don't understand why I treat Joseph with so little regard in these contexts. <laughs> it's because we go way, way back. But if you listen long enough, you'll understand how much I venerate him as a teacher of meditation and a friend, I should say. So you lose this sense of self, which is to say that you have an experience in meditation after which now every time you look, every time you pay attention, every time you're no longer distracted by 
the flow of thought or anything else in your life, and you pay attention consciously, you do not feel like a self the way you used to, right? You've lost this sense right. of, of there's a subject riding around in your head. Now, would you go so far as to say that is an experience of non-duality? I mean, that non-duality is not the concept you get in, in Theravada Buddhism where you first had this experience, but this is very much the concept you get in, in some other traditions. Is selflessness, in that sense, synonymous with, with non-dual awareness, or do those break apart for you at all? First to say, uh, the term non-dual awareness is not a term that I generally use. And there are reasons for that. But given your question and the use of that term, I would equate the two because the sense of duality comes from subject and object. And if there's no subject, then, right. <laughs> then there's no, there's no yeah. duality in that, in that context. Right. The reason I don't like to use the term is because to me, the use of the term I don't know. I think, there's a, I think there's a particular word for when something contains within it an inherent contradiction. Mm -hmm. uh, a performative contradiction. Yeah, it's a, yeah. So to me, the use of the term non-dual in contrast to the dual, <laughs> the term itself is creating duality. And so that's why, that's why I don't like to that, use that's the That's why, term. I guess, emptiness, the concept of emptiness gets at it a little more. I mean, not, yeah. not to the, the lay person's ear right. in English, yes. but when you get yes. into what yes. is meant by emptiness in Buddhism. Yes. That, and that, that's why I would, for myself, I, I use that term more, right. more frequently. Maybe we'll, we'll get there. I think we have a question on that topic. But so back to the experience, though. You lose the sense of self, but you don't lose it permanently in the sense that you can still be distracted by thought, identified with thought. So you're going about your business and you have a thought that makes you angry. And by definition, for that period of time, whether it's five seconds or five minutes, you don't even know you're thinking. Arguably, being lost in thought is a kind of psychosis. It's a psychosis that's universally subscribed. Everyone's in this condition most of their lives. But to be thinking without knowing that you're thinking and just talking to someone who's not there, right, is certainly analogous to dreams that we have while we're asleep, right? and they're not lucid, we don't know we're dreaming. So you're, you're in that delusion, arguing with someone who's not there, and it's kindling all of those negative emotions. And then mindfulness comes online, you recognize a thought as a thought, the thought, images and language just vanish in the mysterious way that they always do. And you are left once again, reestablished in this moment of clarity, which again, that the, now the signature of clarity is there is no self to be seen, right? Now, in the beginning of people's practice, they don't necessarily have that experience. When people start practicing mindfulness, they feel like it's me over here being mindful. And so that their sense of self is not put into question at all. But they can still have this experience of being lost in thought, noticing a thought, the thought goes away, and now it's, now it's just me here being mindful again, yes. waiting for the next thought or paying attention to the breath or whatever but still the self is there. So, but after you've had this experience of uprooting the sense of self, in a moment of mindfulness, you have no more self. So then, how would you describe the character of being lost in thought for someone like you at this point? So when you're lost, and the next moment of mindfulness has not arrived, right? So you are lost in thought. Is there any difference between you now and an ordinary person who has no meditative experience, or who you were before you had your uprooting of self-view. And just to clarify, I think it's clear, but just to clarify, I'm not at all talking about what is available to you by virtue of the next moment of no, mindfulness, I, no, or like it's just, just yeah. that time sequence when right. you are lost. Right. I would say that, and, and this, is, this is not precise, what I'm about to say, you know, and so it's, it's my sense of the difference. And that is, there seems to be, one might say, different intensities of being lost. And, and so even though the mind gets lost in, you know, in the way you described, 
Well, let me. I'll, I'll put it another way, and I, I really haven't thought about this before, so that's why I'm mm. trying to formulate now, you know, a description of my experience. Looking at it from another side, I think the difference of the intensity of being lost is indicated by the greater ease in coming back to mindfulness and letting go. You know, right. and that I've really observed. So even when the mind is really lost, because it's not so completely lost, you know, or so fully lost, or I, don't, I don't know exactly the right words, it takes a lot less time and there's a lot more ease in seeing through it again. Uh, so I, that, that's some, hmm. some reflection of the difference. Actually, I have a different view of it for myself, but it it could be described in exactly the same experience, but it, it's a different, it's almost a the mirror mm -hmm. reverse of what you just described. I feel like the experience of being lost is equivalent for everyone, equivalent for me at various points in time in, in mm -hmm. my life and equivalent by just assumption for, for everyone, whether they know how to meditate or not. But one thing that happens with practice is intense emotion, especially suffering, but mm. even positive emotion, but especially negative emotion, functions as a kind of alarm clock, functions yes. as a kind of mindfulness alarm. So by the very nature, you don't get very far before mindfulness starts to come online as you turn up the dial of intensity. Yes. And if your mindfulness at that point, having uprooted this view of self, if your mindfulness is synonymous with this loss of subject-object perception, well then, as you turn up the intensity of experience, you begin to just cut through to a sense of selflessness, almost by definition. Whereas I feel that if you put my mind on a, on a channel of, of really kind of low-level, mediocre experience, my being lost, let's say, you know, I'm trying to navigate, you know, the phone tree of, you know, some corporation I'm trying to call, right? So I haven't started to tear my hair out because then I would begin to notice my mind's getting out of balance, but I'm just trying to follow the prompts, right? Did they say one or two? In that moment of identification with thought and uncertainty and, you know, engaging some behavioral program, that has nothing at all to do with me paying attention clearly to the character of my own consciousness. I feel like in that moment, my mind is as dull and dualistic and unilluminated by practice as it could ever be. I don't know how it would be different in that mm -hmm. moment, because that's just a moment of fixation on some object. And uh, yeah, I can relate to the way you're describing that. But I think, I think and again, we're using images now to describe these mind states. But I think one of the differences is, is, yeah, in a moment of being lost, it's like we're holding, we're fixated. We're mm -hmm. holding on to a thought or a feeling or an emotion. Maybe there are degrees of how tightly we're holding on. Well, yeah, because if it gets tighter and tighter, then the alarm goes off. No, yes. What I experience is that because of a certain understanding of selflessness, even when we're lost, the mind is not holding on as tightly, and it doesn't require the level of intensity for the alarm to go off. Right. So those, are, those two are the consequences, I think, of some understanding that it's all selfless, even when one is caught. The mind is not holding on as tightly to it, and we become aware that it is holding on to whatever extent quicker. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Although that seems to be this same process. It's just you know, quicker is the quicker you get, the less there's yeah, a sense yes, of ever holding yeah, on to anything yeah. or being lost yeah. in anything. So actually, this raises a related point again from the other side. So, given that the sense of self is illusory. Yes, it's not that you have a it. self that really exists yes. that you kill through Correct. meditation. Correct. You're seeing that something was never there that you presumed was there. So it's true to say of ordinary people who have never meditated, who have never thought about their minds in these terms, 
who have a very strong sense of self and have no idea what we're talking about right now, it's true that their self isn't there any more than yourself is there in each moment of consciousness. So what is really happening for people is they're not noticing when their self isn't there. So when, you, when you're identified with thought, it's not like that creates a self that has to be canceled through some other effort. It's just the experience of being identified with thought is a kind of selfless experience, but it's just a full immersion in the thought, yes. right? So if, if it's an angry thought, you're busy getting angry. And what I feel like happens for people is that they're often losing their sense of self in ways that they could mm -hmm. recognize. Because they don't know how to meditate, they can't do this on demand, so they can't control yes. it. But retrospectively, whenever they're asked, whenever you're, they're tapped mm -hmm. on the shoulder and you say, well, how do you feel right now? Their sense of self always comes online. The self-concept mm -hmm. always comes online. But if they could pay attention to the flow of their experience, they would recognize that it's constantly being interrupted by them just being immersed in classical flow experiences that are positive, yes. but even just being lost in their work or just being distracted. Just being distracted has the character of losing yourself. Mm -hmm. You're lost to the, the dream mm -hmm. of whatever you're paying attention to. Yeah, I know. I think I, I can agree with all that. And it's really interesting even to expand it a little more. I was, I was thinking of the sense of flow, you know, that has been talked about, mm. which is, a you know, an experience that many people have, whether it's in sport or music or different experiences. But also, I think we we lose the sense of self very often... Uh, in acts of generosity or love or compassion, you know, where, where it really, those do become selfless expressions, spontaneous mm. expressions. So I think people do have the experience, you know, at different times in their lives through a whole, in a whole variety of circumstances. And as you say, that the particular quality of the selfless aspect may not be attended to, yeah, even though yeah. they're experiencing it that way. Well, in fact, I think it, the place where people most reliably lose it are kind of classically unreflective experiences like watching television, watching a movie, reading a book, where you're just immersed in something. I mean, you're having reactions, you're having a kind of vicarious experience. It's not, I mean, this is not the same thing as meditation, but people are kind of subjectively disappearing into a, a sort of dreamscape when they're being entertained right. In the moments when they're not is when the entertainment isn't working. Right. When you're aware that you're just staring at a screen or you're aware of the other people next to you in the movie theater, well, those are moments where you're, you're not on the ride. But when you're really on the ride, there is a kind of just loss of self-consciousness. Yes. But somehow I, I, it feels important in some way to well, yeah, distinguish no, yeah, that. Yeah, none of that counts as meditation practice. Or even, I think, I think in some way, and we... I don't know if we could tease it apart, but I think fundamentally it's a different experience than the selflessness. Well, you're not aware of selflessness in the moment. I guess what, it, what I'm trying to point to is that it's a, we have a kind of amnesia for selflessness. I think people are constantly having their sense of self interrupted mm -hmm. by watching television or by just suddenly paying attention to anything or being lost in thought. And yet whenever they reflect on who they are or what it's like to be them because they, they don't have mindfulness that cuts through to the obviousness of selflessness in each moment. They feel like, oh, it's just me here again. Here's my sense of self. And they kind of project that mm. back into all the previous moments, but it wasn't actually mm. there yeah. in those moments. Yeah. It was actually interrupted. Retrospectively, you can appreciate how unreliable this or impermanent this feeling of I is because some of the experiences you like in life are synonymous with its interruption. So when you I, get fully immersed in, in anything. Can I conclude then that my habit of spy book reading is actually furthering and deepening my understanding? No, as a... <laughs> unfortunately not. This is, this is the habit to which Joseph refers. Joseph is the kind of person who you can walk into an airport bookstore and stand before the the wall of garish Junk books. <laughs> covered books, just all the brightly covered, terrible paperbacks, 
and he can look from top to bottom left at a whole wall and honestly say, I've read all of these. I've been in that airport. Almost, <laughs> almost. I think this is a true this, story. This is, just the, this is just the expression of selflessness, yeah. Sam. Well, yeah, or non-discrimination. <laughs> Given an infinite amount to read, you, you you have found the part of the infinite set that is not worth reading. Krishnamurti, didn't he demand that his students read nothing other than junk books, detective know. novels? Because he, he was trying to cancel their spiritual materialism. He didn't want them reading Buddhist suttas or anything. So it's it's working for you, Joseph. Did you ever meet Krishnamurti? I saw him. I didn't meet him personally, but I was at some of his lectures. Uh -huh. Quite related to what we were just talking about. So what percentage of your time would you say you are in the clarity of selfless mindfulness? And what percentage <laughs> is, this is a question you're not going to want to answer. There are Buddhist taboos around answering questions like this. Although the Hindus will, will just, will be quite forthcoming here. And what percentage of time are you lost in the sense of being identified with thought, thinking without knowing that you're thinking? First, how confident are you that the answer you're about to give is honest? Has any relationship <laughs> to what is true of your mind? Are you in a position to answer this question? Uh, before answering that, I think the question needs clarification, because really have to have to be more specific about what being lost in thought means. So, for example, the question could refer to, you know, how often are you lost in long trains of thought in stories? You know, that you're in the story and whatever you're doing, you know, in the course of a day, you're just in your mental world and in some story or other, and five minutes later, you, you realize and you wake up. Right. So that's one understanding of being lost. Let me just clarify it then. Whether it's for a long time or a short time, if you add up all the time, what percentage of your time is it? If it's five minutes, but you've punctuated those five minutes with a million interruptions, I'll grant you that's a very different kind of five minutes than, no, but than I was five th uninterrupted minutes. But I was thinking of something else, not so much punctuating the five minutes, but rather an experience I've had, and this has become very interesting for me and, and a significant part of my practice, is just really watching for the very quickly passing thoughts that pass mm. through the mind that are not disturbing, they're light, they just pass through, but which we hardly pay attention to because they're not particularly impactful. So, so it's like an undercurrent of thought. Yeah, an undercurrent, and it, they they may not be long. That it may not be a stream. It may be, right. It may be a few seconds of just kind of a light thought. You're sort of describing it as though you're mindful of those thoughts. No, but well, you're, you're talking about being being identified briefly with those thoughts. No, what I'm saying is that I think that there's a large percentage of the time that kind of undercurrent of quickly passing light thoughts is going through. So I, that w that would be a large percentage, a much smaller percentage. And I don't. Know, it, it is really hard to come up with a number, but it's much less often that the mind is caught up in long stories. Not that it never is, mm. but it's much less than the former. I found it really interesting for periods of time, and I do this as a practice to really keep an eye out for those quickly passing ones. And when I do that, I realize, oh yeah, I can I can be aware, even mm. the light ones, for some period of time. And then, you know, the mindfulness weakens a little bit and that stream happens again. One of the things that's been a huge help in diminishing the time lost in the long, the long stories is that one of the fundamental Buddhist practices is mindfulness of the body. You know, whether it's mindfulness just of movement, of walking, because when we're mindful of the sensations in the body, the mind is not lost in thought. And, you know, over years of practice, of developing it, that can become more of a default place, you know, for the mind to rest 
than the default of just, you know, endlessly thinking. It's certainly not a hundred percent. Right. But, but I've noticed very often as I'll be moving about, especially, especially when I'm by myself, very often I find my mind just attentive to the movement of the body, you know? So I feel like there has been a big diminishment of being, but what the percentage is, as I say, the, there's been major dis diminishment of the long stories mm. of the very quickly passing ones that happens much more frequently, but it's also become an, a very interesting place in my own practice. Is it easier to answer if, it, if we talk about it from the other side? What percentage of time are you clearly established in just center of the bullseye, yeah, non, <laughs> non-dual, non-self mindfulness? Is it easier to get a handle on it from that it, side? It, it is not so much easier because it so much depends on what I'm doing. You know, so at certain times, in certain situations, I would say that the percentage of really being mindful is much greater. And in other situations, I would say it's less. But like if, if you are watching a movie or reading oh, one no, of those horrible the, books that you no, read. No, when, when the mind is lost, when the mind is engaged in conceptual activity. It's by definition not being mindful? I, I would say... And again, this is something Munindra, my, my first teacher, he made he made kind of distinction here, which I found helpful, that when you when the mind is engaged in some conceptual intellectual activity, one is just in that. You don't have this you don't have the same degree of mindfulness that you would have in walking meditation. But he he talked about you know, I don't know if there's a technical term for this. But he talked about a kind of awareness, even in that situation where we're, we're pretty lost in what we're doing, but there's enough awareness that would pick up if the mind goes into an unwholesome state. So if we're reading something and it makes us angry, there's enough mindfulness present so that would trigger the mindfulness. Right. So, it's, so it's not totally lost, but it's also... Doesn't that pose a conceptual problem, though, in that clearly, so just picture the goal here of being a fully enlightened being or a Buddha or a fully, you know, someone who's fully stabilized right. in this no longer being taken in by the illusion of self. Well, they're certainly not reading junk books. Well, no, but presumably they could, right? Like if you handed the Buddha a junk book, he could read it and extract meaning from it and then right. condemn you for wasting your time <laughs> so gratuitously. So... It is cognitively yeah. possible for yeah. someone who has mastered mindfulness to watch a movie, right. read a book. So then why is it, why would doing any of those right. things for an expert be synonymous with a, just a real degradation in their right. attention? You know, the, this is something that I'm waiting to uh, see. It may well be that at a certain level of development, it is totally possible to be engaged in this way hmm. and have total mindfulness as one's doing it. So I see the possibility. I'm just talking about my current level. Yeah. Uh, it might be those books, actually. <laughs> of understanding. Uh, although it's interesting, in reading Dharma books, right? I feel that there is that as one's reading... It can become part of, the, uh, of a meditation. Yeah. Yeah. And I've certainly, I've had that experience, and I think other people too, and that's probably why it's recommended by yeah. the wise <laughs> that these are good books to be reading. Well, you also, presumably, you also have that experience in explaining the Dharma yourself. I mean, it's in speaking. Oh, that, absolutely. Yeah. That, yes. Yeah. That's why it's interesting in, in kind of the, the Buddhist conception of things, you know, and in, in the innumerable, innumerable lists, Speaking the Dharma and reading the Dharma are listed under meditation. Those are considered meditative activities, mm. you know, and I think we've had the experience of that being so. Yeah, yeah. So back to our questions here. A few questions on people who are looking for proof of the legitimacy of this whole enterprise, right? 
So not having experienced meditation themselves or not having practiced enough to unequivocally know there's some benefit there. The only other way to judge this, it would seem, is to judge other people's experience from the outside. People who are meditation teachers or people who've done a lot of practice who are advertising the fruits of this practice to one degree or another, or obviously failing to advertise it. How reasonable is it to think you can judge another person's experience from the outside? And is there a mismatch between the hallmarks of realization and people's expectations of what it would look like to be enlightened or wise or free or selfless? I'll just give a part of my view here. There are people who are probably very deeply realized in terms of the kind of the stability with which they can recognize the kinds of truths about the mind that we're talking about, who you'd be hard pressed to see in them the enlightened ideal. And then there's the opposite sort of person who maybe wouldn't strike you as a Buddha, but there are some very charismatic, free, unself conscious, self actualized people who probably don't have a moment of mindfulness in their lives, right? There are people who, for whatever reason, are just rock stars of their own self-invention, and they have no apparent psychological problems. They're the person most people want to be, and yet it's not by virtue of mindfulness that they've got there. So talk me well, through I, those conundrums. I think you know, one, way of, one way of viewing it is, is something that the Dalai Lama suggested when somebody asked him about choosing a teacher, and he said, study them carefully for five years. You really, wa really watch, watch their behavior, watch how they are. Of course, we don't know. We sometimes don't have that opportunity. But I think over time, we do begin to see the many different sides of people, you know, and get a sense of whether the ennobling qualities that we ascribe to at least some level of awakening are really there. Are pe people are actually living them or not, whether they're Mm. simply talking the talk, or their life is manifesting those qualities. But that, that can take really a close observation, not necessarily simply believing what people say about themselves. <laughs> one of the, th one of the uh, I think, signs for ourselves, you know, seeing, okay, I've been practicing, I don't know if anything's happening. You know, I'm seeing the same old patterns come up again and again. Is this really working? It's something uh, that Dan Harris uh, talks about a lot. And mm. He's the ABC News anchor that I did the meditation app with. He says that his wife is a good barometer mm. for the value of meditation in how she sees him and sees his behavior. You know, so that even if he's still caught up in, you know, whatever patterns he's very familiar with, mm. his wife sees the effect. So sometimes that's the... Uh, Speaking from personal experience, I think that's too high a bar. <laughs> no one will escape hanging. Him. Our wives have to judge our enlightenment. But it seems to me that there are, there are other pieces here that can, that can confuse the issue. For instance, like having a strong ethical framework in which you mm -hmm. view this whole enterprise. Obviously, not all traditions have equivalent ethical frameworks, and some don't have any at all. Or some, there's some people who are, have probably fairly deep experience in things like meditation, who, because of how they came to it, can't check all the obvious boxes of, that you, you want your teacher to check, frankly, and you want just even your, your friends to be able to check in terms of how they're committed to living their lives, so not lying, for instance. So you have, this is obviously the, something that, that many people experienced and continue to experience at the hands of various gurus. I mean, you look at people like you know, Swami Muktananda, right? So coming from a, a non-Buddhist background, he was a Hindu who brought Siddha Yoga to the United States back in, I guess maybe started in the 60s, but mostly the 70s and 80s. And, you know, he's trailing a fair number of casualties in terms of his unethical behavior, but very few people would imagine that he actually didn't have 
very significant experience in meditation and probably much more significant if you had just if you could have ridden shotgun with him through all his meditations it would have been a more interesting ride than you would have had with other people who given a a much more ethical framework are showing up like much more classically responsible teachers of meditation. They they don't lie. They don't. They certainly don't build a tunnel from their sleeping quarters to the girls' dormitory at their ashram, as Muktananda is reported to have done. The uh, rapist that he probably was. So this is, a, I guess, a related question: Is there a direct connection in your mind between maturity in mindfulness or in meditation practice generally and living ethically? Yeah. So first, it's to. You know, we've been using the word meditation and meditative experience, but as you know, there's a huge range of what that covers, and there's a lot of meditative experience that's profound and involves tremendous power in the mind, but is not necessarily uh, co-joined with wisdom, you know, and so people can, can be very powerful figures and still not have, in terms that I was using before, uprooted greed and desire and hatred and delusion. So one one important thing to do is just to have a sense of uh, the range of what's included in meditation and to start, you know, discerning the difference between power and wisdom because these often can get conflated. Uh, For me, it's always interesting if people are behaving unethically in obvious ways, certainly to start with in obvious ways, and then maybe even in more subtle ways, I would question, well, what's the motive behind those actions? You know, and it seems to me that the motive behind something that's unethical will almost certainly be an unwholesome motivation. You know, it'll be because of greed, because of wanting, or because of some kind of aversion, or because of delusion. It could also be facilitated by a another framework, which is just leading them to be kind of classically unethical, but they're interpreting it differently. So you know, if you're a tantric mm-hmm. yogi, you know, who thinks that having sex with your students is part of your compassionate yes. instruction of them, right? And it's just by accident that you happen to be picking out the prettiest of your students. They could be wrong about that. I guess in some universe they could be right about that, but still it could be animated by some level of, of greed. I guess it's just, for me, having a benign framework, conceptual framework, counts for a lot, but really has nothing intrinsically to do with having broken through to a, a real experience of selflessness. And I suspect that people can have a real experience of selflessness completely unanchored to anything we would call a deep ethical code. And therefore, they can be kind of wild men and women in terms of how they show up. They can be classically irresponsible. And yet, they do actually have significant meditation experience and, and even attainment by you know, ordinary standards. Yeah, I think, I think that's possible. But again, I, I think it would, it would take a further discernment of what you are calling this kind of wildly irresponsible behavior. Hmm. I could imagine that behavior really being free from unwholesome motivation, but I could also imagine that there, there are unskillful states in the mind of, of desire, you know, or aversion, or that are not being seen. All right, Joseph, I now notice that we have come up on the two-hour mark. Let me see if there's a final question here. Advice for a first-time meditation retreat for an excited newcomer. What advice do you have for people just starting to meditate and someone, in this case, who's actually going to sit their first retreat? Is there anything you can say now that, if absorbed, will keep someone from suffering unnecessarily in a way that most people or certainly many people wind up doing on their first retreat? Something that is very common but unhelpful is uh, judging one's practice. 
you know, because inevitably, not only in the beginning, but all the way through, there are lots of ups and downs in the practice, times when it's going well, times when it's difficult, times when the body is easeful, times when it's painful, times when the mind is calm, times when it's restless. And it's very easy and common to judge the practice on the basis of how it feels. Oh, when, when it feels good, I'm doing well. When it doesn't feel good, it means I'm practicing badly. And this is, this is a common, common response, but that is not helpful because inevitably there will be these cycles and we can be mindful of whatever experience is arising. And right. all of these experiences can be equally valuable in the meditation unfolding. So it's very helpful if one kind of takes that in, in the beginning and it really helps just develop, uh, more ease and patience and openness to the ups and downs, realizing, yeah, this is all part of the journey. Uh, I think that mm -hmm. that would be of tremendous, uh, tremendous help to, to remind oneself of that. Actually, one, one final question, because I, I see it here and it, it relates to where we started in, in mentioning guided meditations and, and our apps. This isn't actually as self-serving as it may sound, but there are many people who don't understand why one would ever want to use a guided meditation. And I mean, there are people who come from a different style of practice, so like TM, where you do mantra meditation, having a guided meditation of the sort you do in Vipassana doesn't map on so obviously to that sort of practice. So can you say something about the utility of guided meditation and why, why that's helpful for people? Yeah, it can be very helpful at different stages in the practice, but particularly in the beginning, uh, because it's somebody really just reminding one to be mindful, you know? And so you're sitting and feeling the body, feeling the breath, being aware of thoughts or emotions, and then, you know, getting lost in some inner story and then hear this voice sit and feel the body you know so it's a reminder to come back it is a mindfulness alarm at exactly. minimum even if there are no new concepts being introduced perversely i find this even in the, the act of recording my own guided meditations for my app yes hearing myself guide yes. myself is just as useful as anything else. It's yes. just, it is just a, a mechanism to remind you that you're supposed to be paying attention. Guiding your non-self. In this case, two <laughs> selves equals no self. Yeah, uh, so in that way, it, it is really helpful. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, your first, your experience, mm -hmm. the most important experience, came when someone was reading yes. to you out of a book. I mean, yes. basically they were guiding you, yes. they were reading a meditation yes. from... Yes. The classic Dzogchen text. That's not normally what's happening in a, a guided meditation, but that does speak in an interesting way, which I think we talked about this in a previous podcast, to the, the power of certain concepts. I mean, you were kind of yes. led by following the conceptual content of what was being read to you to thread the needle of your own yes. mind. It wasn't just being reminded to yes. be mindful again. Yes. The concepts were important. Yeah, and some there are some guided meditations even in this tradition, you know, which I do, which are like that. I think of very, just related to this, both in terms of guided meditations, but also in reading, there's a big difference between hearing things or reading things as a description or hearing them and reading them as an instruction. Hmm. And I found that generally we tend to experience the words, whether read or listened to, as descriptions of things. But when we take it as an instruction, that really has a liberating power. You mm. know, it's, and I've had this experience at different times. I can be reading a text, something I've read many times. You think, oh yeah, that's a good description of whatever, the body right. of the mind. And then I'll take it, oh, this is something to do, not something. Yeah. And in that, just in that, switch, sometimes there can be a real illumination of something not previously seen. Yeah. yeah. And so the guided meditation is emphasizing that side. It's using words as instructions to do. Okay, do this, do this, do this. Mm. And in the doing of it, 
you know, there's a real possibility of deepening understanding. Well, Joseph, this is our third podcast. You now tie the record holder for numbers of appearances on my podcast. Right. Although there may be a diminishing number of people who listen to them right. as we go from one to two to three. No, I think, I think you're doing pretty well. I think number two is more than number one. So, but in any case, this is, it's always fairly esoteric with you, but no apologies. There is some subset of people who will get these uh -huh. facts nowhere else and want them. So once again, thank you well, for doing welcome. this. It's fun talking about it. Yeah. Yeah, and we we fought less this time. Yes. I noticed in the previous time. So if you want Which to hear, maybe a sign of our growing maturity. Yeah. Yes, or <laughs> oh, my tiredness. Yeah, but if you want to hear us fight, you can go back and listen to podcasts <laughs> one and number two. one and two. So anyway, Joseph, to be continued. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. You can leave reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can discuss it on your own blog or podcast, or you can support it directly at samharris.org forward slash support.